Company, known as Dr. Cog Tech. I call this to order the April 5th, 2021 Dr. Cog Tech meeting. The meeting is being recorded. Dr. Cog has officially switched the digital platform to Zoom. So you may notice the layout is slightly different than you are used to. Members and alternates, you will now have the ability to mute and unmute yourselves and share your webcam. With this new platform, even though we are now able to use cameras, we still ask that you use the raise the hand function button. So to indicate um, you have a question or would like to speak for an agenda item uh, with questions or comments, please make sure that you typed your name that reflects your first and last name in your representation. If you have a technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions related to the agenda items. At this time, uh, I'd like to introduce, we do have a new member, Melanie um, Chico, and I probably did not pronounce the name correctly. She's from Denver and uh, is in the capital and, and she is the capital planning and projects lead in the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, um, she replaces Eileen Yazi. Welcome, Melanie. At this time, Cam, we'll list all attendees if for some reason you do not hear your name, please email cam at ckennedy at drcog.org so your name can be added to the record. Cam, if you'll call roll. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in attendance, I currently see Andy Taylor, Annie Rice, Beth uh, Dilboa, Brad Calvert, Chris Chauvin, Danny Herman, David Gaspers, you, Eileen Yazzie, Eugene Howard, Evan Pinkham, Jane Rao, Jane Sanson, Jessica Furco, Jordan Rudall, Julie George, Lauren Pulver, Lawrence Trelong, Lisa Nguyen, Matthew Helfant, Melissa Balding, Michael Snow, Michael Timlin, Myron Hora, uh, Northwest Douglas County Chamber, Sangu Lee, Smart Commute Metro North, uh, Aaron Busto, Alex Hyde Wright, uh, Alvin Badal Sanchez, Bill Soros, Brian Weimer, Carol Buchanan, Deborah Basket, uh, Derek Webb, Emily Lindsay, Frank Bruno, Jacob Rigger, Kelly Heaton, Kevin Ash, uh, Kristen FTA. Long Nguyen, Mac Callison, Marissa Gaugan, Megan Davis, Melanie Chiquette, Mike Whitaker, Paul Gisaitis, Phil Greenwald, Ron Papsdorf, Sarah Grant, Steve Cook, Steve Duran, Todd Cottrell, and uh, T. Riff, Mr. Chair. Thank you. At this time, we'll have public um, open the meeting to public comment. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you join by phone, please raise your hand, your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and then you will be need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. As a reminder to everyone, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussions regarding each agenda item. So at this time, if you have public comment, please uh, raise your hand. I do not see any hands raised and I don't see any star nine uh, hands raised. So at this time, we'll uh, close public comment. Mr. And, Chair. Uh, yes. Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir. This is Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cogstaff. Um, I just wanna make a suggestion in this new format using Zoom, we are pulling over all of the members and alternates of TEC so that they should be panelists in this meeting format. Uh, whereas other folks who are just truly attending or attendees 
Um, it looks like we may have a few uh, members or alternates that are still on the attendee side that need to be pulled over, pulled over to panelists. So can I suggest that those folks either raise their hand or type in the Q&A or identify themselves in some way that staff can pull those folks over before we get into uh, action items? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you. It looks like you do have a couple of hands raised there to, to, to bring over. Okay, I believe all of those have been brought over. Um, Long, I see you have your hand raised. Is, do you have a question? No, I don't have a question. Okay, Thanks. thank you. All right, I believe everybody's over. I don't see any other hands raised. So therefore we will uh, move on to our um, next item, which is, um, is there any discussion or questions about the February 22nd, 2021 TAC meeting summary? If so, please raise your hand uh, button and indicate you have a question or would like to speak. Brian? Yeah, so on page three, I noticed that my name has a typo in it. So just a minor little uh, letter change, so. Oh, okay, we'll, we'll make that note. Thank um, you. Any others on there, Brian? No, that was the only place I saw. Okay, that. and then um, Jessica uh, Furco, you had a, uh, your hand yeah. raised? Um, I just had a note. I think there was one voting item that I said it passed unanimously, unanimously and I didn't vote on it. I don't know if that's something that needs to be reflected or not. Yeah, we'll, we'll note that in the in the record on, on there. Thank you for yes. bringing that to our attention. Are there any other um, corrections to the to the meeting summary? Ron, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Jessica, can I just clarify? Did you did you abstain from the vote? Um, I was intending to, just because I didn't have enough information to make an informed vote since it was my first meeting, um, but just due to some technical difficulties, I wasn't able to. Okay, thank you for the clarification. We'll mark down that you abstained. Thank you, Ron. Um, with the corrections noted, the, the, meetings, uh, the meeting minutes are approved and we'll now move on to the next item, which Mr. is- Chair. Yes. Yeah, sorry, sir, to interrupt you again. Um, but just one more time, I'm still noticing one or two uh, TEC members or alternates on the attendee side. Uh, so again, if you joined late, all TEC members and alternates should be panelists, not attendees. So um, if you could raise your hand, your virtual hand, if you are a TEC member or alternate and you think you're on the attendee side so that uh, we can identify you and have staff pull you over, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Are we ready to move forward, Jacob? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Our first action item today is fiscal year 22, fiscal year 23, community mobility planning and implementation, the CMP, CMPI uh, set aside eligibility. And I believe Derek Webb will make a presentation on this. Uh, Derek? Yes, hello everyone, um, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Derek Webb. I'm a planner at Dr. Cog. Um, if you recall from uh, the February 22nd TAC meeting, uh, we brought the updated CMPI eligibility rules and selection process document uh, as an informational item, uh, really to highlight just a few key changes. And uh, it was really primarily the, the inclusion of the priority emphasis area and the, uh, for the set aside and some administrative updates. Um, I'm back today to highlight two small additional changes since we last spoke and ultimately to, to ask for a recommendation to the Regional Transportation Committee. 
Um, but first, uh, before that, that recommendation, um, I do want to highlight the two changes. So the first one uh, is an additional 444, I'm sorry, an additional $440,000 has been added to the FY2022-2023 uh, cycle, 200,000 of that added to the planning side um, of the, the set aside, and then 240,000 uh, added to the small infrastructure side, bringing those totals to uh, 1,692,000. Um, and 1,235,000 respectively. Um, and then the second change uh, is in the project selection section of the document. Just wanna highlight that um, we've had a lot of conversations recently with uh, CDOT, I'm just trying to, uh, to, to strengthen our coordination around this uh, set aside. And um, as such, um, we've decided to uh, add CDOT staff from both region one and region four, along with DTD uh, at CDOT headquarters as potential advisory participants uh, to the project selection or project review panel. Um, they won't have a, have a voting role, um, but will potentially be able to add uh, pro uh, or provide valuable insight uh, really in the area of the small infrastructure side of the set aside, um, some of the, the intricacies that can, can be involved in some of those projects. Um, really, that's, everything else is the same as we discussed last time. Just wanted to highlight those two uh, minor updates. Uh, but with that, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions for Derek? If so, please raise your hand. Brian, see so your hand is raised. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, can you expand a little bit where this additional money came from? Uh, sure. So uh, it is actually from um, RTD, uh, RTD's return funds, um, one from an FY19 stamp project and one from um, last cycle's CMPI and FY20 CMPI project. Um, so it, the CMPI project was a uh, small infrastructure project. And, and of course the, the stationary master plan or stamp UC project was a, was a planning. So we just kind of put those into their respective pots within this, um, this set aside. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If anyone else has questions, please raise your hand. Brian, did you have an additional one or just? I no. guess I have to put money into the uh, pot because I didn't lower my, my hand. <laughs> What's, is it a quarter or a dollar? What is it with this group? So. I think the first meeting it's free. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, with that, um, we'll take a motion. Um, so, since, oh, I do see Phil Greenwald had a question. Phil, go ahead. All right, yeah, I have a quick question. This is Phil Greenwald from City of Longmont. Um, just in the scoring portion of this, is it going to be just, um, you know, is the low scoring going to have a range then of the scores? Is that the plan? Or is it going to be kind of an all or nothing low score is, you know, like five out of 15 and mediums 10 out of 15 and highs 15 out of 15? Or is it going to be a range within the low, medium and highs? Thank you. Um, it, so the, the way we ran it last, uh, last cycle during the, the project review, um, it was a range. So if it was a low score, you know, it was like you mentioned, you know, anywhere from zero to five, um, you know, five to 10, what have you based on what, uh, what the, the amount, um, on each of those, um, categories is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Phil. Are there any other, uh, questions? Brian? With that, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. I move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee uh, approval of the eligibility rules and selection process for the Community Mobility Planning and Implementation Transportation Improvement Program set aside for fiscal years 2022 and 2023 as presented today. Thank you. Is there a second? Phil, I see you have your hand up. Second. Okay, we have been moved by Brian and seconded by Phil. Um, uh, on there. Uh, and uh, so um, please use the raise hand I can if, uh, well, sorry. So with that, we'll take votes. All those uh, in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, all those opposed say nay. Nay. 
Any abstentions? With that, the motion passes. Thank you. We'll move on to our next agenda item at this point, and that's a presentation of the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan by uh, Jacob Rieger. Jacob. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Give me just a second here. Okay, can folks see the screen? Great, okay. Well, thank you very much, Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog's staff, along with my colleague, Alvin Vidal Sanchez. Um, believe it or not, after almost two years of our 2050 planning process, uh, we are at the point of asking TAC to recommend adoption of the uh, 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan um, and the associated air quality conformity determination documents um, that go with it. So we have a brief presentation just to give a little bit of context and reminder of where we've been, um, how we got here. Uh, we also particularly wanna focus on the work that we did during the 30 day public comment period um, and kind of wrap this up. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Alvin, uh, to start us off, Alvin. Thanks, Jacob. Good afternoon, TAC members. So a reminder of why we have the RTP and the role it plays in our planning process. It does set the region's multimodal vision for the transportation system over the next 20 plus years. The 2050 RTP looks out 30 years. While the RTP sets the vision, the short range plan, the transportation improvement program actually implements those priorities. We're at the tail end of our regular four-year update, and that updates based on our designation as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Denver region and our air quality status. Speaking of our air quality status, uh, we do have to address ozone, carbon monoxide, and PM10 pollutants. So part of our plan are our air quality conformity determination documents, a whole appendix devoted to them. Air quality conformity is regional for both the RTP and the TIP, so it's not based on individual projects, but it does look at the transportation networks that are included in the regional travel model. The 2050 RTP did pass all of its emissions tests, and if you want more information on this topic, it is a devoted appendix in the RTP. Every plan cycle is a little different, so we wanted to highlight some of the ways that we took a different approach for the 2050 RTP. Uh, one of the main ones was looking at our regional priorities that we've heard expressed both through this plan process, as well as the last couple of years of planning that we've done. Uh, those include safety, vision zero, air quality, uh, all the way over to active transportation and freight. Uh, these priorities carried forward into our project selection, solicitation, and evaluation that we ran. So we went to project sponsors and requested a diverse range of multimodal projects to include in the plan. So we evaluated those and we've included those in our plan. We've also included what we're calling programmatic investments. So allocations to projects that we just don't know what they might be yet, but relate to our priorities. So safety projects over the next 30 years, active transportation projects over the next 30 years. And then we've also had public and stakeholder engagement throughout the last two years. Underlying uh, all of this process has been our vision and needs. Uh, we looked at all of the great planning work that's been done over the last couple of years from Dr. Cog, our member governments, as well as CEDAW and RTD and other partners that have a stake in the transportation system in the region. And we uh, just looked at what vision they were establishing through their documents and carried those forward into the RTP and used these documents as the basis for our project solicitation and ultimately the projects that are being included in the RTP. Across the four chapters and appendices, we've included a lot of different information ranging from public and stakeholder engagement to a profile of the current transportation system. We also talk about the different outcomes that we anticipate seeing through the investments in the plan. And then there's a whole range of analysis being done, especially in our appendices for folks who wanna look at methodologies, forecasts, get into some of the inputs and outputs from all of our different modeling that we've done. Now we took all of the priorities that we heard from our public and stakeholders and articulate six in the RTP, safety, air quality, regional transit, active transportation, freight, and multimodal mobility. We've tagged information across the plan with these six priorities. We've also organized our investments around these six priorities, and we've also shown outcomes related to each of these in the plan. Now, looking at the limited regional funding that we had available out to 2050, we did, like I mentioned, organize our investments around these six priorities. Uh, using our limited regional funding, we wanted to make sure that we were providing a balance of projects across the region and that those projects were sensitive to their local context. A key part of our fiscally constrained project lists are also our local projects 
So projects that we uh, note as coming strictly from our local governments or our toll authorities. So 100% local projects compared to our regionally funded projects. And I'll pass it back off to Jacob. Great, thanks Alvin. So as I said, I also wanted to talk about uh, the work that we've done in the last month or so during the 30 day public comment period. Um, as I think most of you know, because you saw at least one of our presentations, uh, we posted the draft regional transportation plan in its appendices on February 12th. And we had our 30 day public comment period through March 17th. Um, and then we had our public hearing in front of our board um, that evening. During the public comment period, particularly in the time of COVID, we really did a, um, a variety of different techniques uh, to try and reach out to people, engage with people. Um, you see some of these listed listed here, everything from eBlast. We had an interactive website um, known as Social Pinpoint that we built that people could engage with the plan. Uh, we had an interactive project map, um, whole series of meetings, um, public meetings, other presentations that we gave and so on. Um, here are some of more specifically some of the things that we did. Uh, we did have an online on demand open house so people could come just sort of at their own leisure and just in, engage and interact with the plan, uh, fill out some surveys, uh, provide their input to the extent that they wanted to. Uh, we had three virtual public meetings um, over the course of the 30 days uh, spaced at different times of day so that people uh, people could participate in at least one of them. Uh, one of those public meetings was a themed public meeting with Mile High Connects uh, to focus on the issues of environmental justice and transportation. Um, we also went around the region virtually and gave a series of presentations, um, several presentations over the 30 day public comment period, um, everything from uh, some advisory groups, uh, several local municipal transportation advisory boards, uh, the county transportation forums, um, and a few others. Um, over on the right of this slide, I won't go through these statistics, but um, you can see we definitely got a lot of engagement, um, variety of these techniques through the 30 day public comment period. We were really, really pleased with the amount of um, engagement and the level of uh, kind of what we heard back from the public, uh, which is ex exactly what we wanted during this, during this process. Um, just some stats for you. One of the things we did was some um, Mentimeter polling. Uh, which I think we've done with this group as well. Um, so anytime that we had a public meeting, um, we did this Mentimeter polling, we kept the questions the same uh, throughout the 30 day public comment period. So none of it's scientific by any means, but just sort of gauging the pulse of uh, folks we were presenting to. Um, asked them a couple questions in particular. Uh, we asked how well do you think the 2050 plan will improve um, the six themes that Alvin talked about? And then we asked how important uh, to each of those audiences that those six themes were. We also asked how well the plan aligns with your ideal transportation system um, and gave people a chance to, to have a variety of responses to that. Um, so again, this is really sort of summarized across a whole series um, of public meetings, but it provides a good snapshot of part of what we heard from the public during this 30 day uh, public comment period. Um, in terms of sort of what we heard uh, from the public and from others during the 30 day public comment period, um, it frankly is a little bit of a fool's errand to try and summarize um, the breadth and the depth uh, of the engagement that we received. Um, just in terms of comments received alone, we got almost 300 comments, um, both from members of the public, uh, local governments, other stakeholders, our federal partners, um, agency partners, and so on. Um, again, we had all the meetings that we got input during those meetings, uh, the public hearing, the Mentimeter polling, everything on the website. Um, so we wanted to be careful here and not sort of under or overgeneralize what we heard from the public. Um, and if you are interested, we do strongly encourage you to look at, um, this is Appendix C as part of the attachments, which is our engagement appendix. We actually incorporated uh, the public comment matrix and staff responses um, based on, on all the public comments we received. But in very general high level terms, uh, from the general public, I would characterize what we heard is definitely strong support for multimodal projects and funding. Uh, many members of the public who took time to comment uh, wanted even more uh, funding and more multimodal projects in the plan. Um, there was frankly from the public who chose to respond, um, I would say minimal support for roadway projects and funding. Um, there was also some interest in equity and environmental justice analysis. We got several comments on that. Um, again, I mentioned that one of our public meetings uh, was a themed meeting around those issues. Uh, we also got several comments during the 30-day public comment period uh, from our local governments. We appreciate that. Um, again, it's hard to generalize sort of a broad set of comments, but in general terms, I think it's fair to say there was support uh, from local governments for the 2050 plan, uh, the projects and priorities within the plan. And there were a lot of what I would characterize as technical questions and sort of requested revisions um, based on local government folks who read the plan. And we do appreciate that thorough review. 
And then we also had some comments from our agency partners as listed here, CDOT, RTD, FTA, Federal Transit Administration, and Federal Highway Administration. Um, again, don't want to overgeneralize other people's comments, but I think in very broad strokes support uh, for the 2050 plan. Um, and really their comments were more about the planning process and I think support for the planning process. Um, and of course, many of them participated in the planning process. Um, and some requested revisions to clarify some of our methodologies, some of the process things that we did, et cetera, to help make the plan as clear as possible um, in the final version. So um, the link that was in the memo to the plan, to the website, the webpage that had the plan in the appendices um, represents the plan as revised, um, along with the 19 appendices revised as needed based on all the public comment we heard uh, during the 30 day public comment period. So this is the motion, which I'm not gonna to read to you, but this is the motion that's in your memo. This is the motion that we're looking for. Um, but before I turn it back to the chair, um, I do very much wanna say thank you uh, to a few, uh, few folks. First of all, to TAC, you really functioned as the steering committee um, during the 2050 regional transportation plan process. Um, there were a lot of meetings, a lot of uh, work sessions. We really appreciate TAC's time um, on this work. Also appreciate local government, CDOT, RTD, Toll Highway authorities, all of our other stakeholders who really spent a lot of time and made a lot of contributions to this plan. Um, and finally, I also want to thank our staff at Dr. Cog um, and the public as well. Um, again, uh, for all the time that the public spent with us, we had our youth advisory panel, our civic advisory group, um, all the folks who took time to comment to us. Um, and again, also want to thank our staff at Dr. Cog. Um, I think I counted at one point there was in the range of 20 to 25 um, staff who touched this plan. Some significant portion of the agency worked on this plan at some point, um, as well as our consultant HDR also made a lot of contributions. So it really does for a regional plan, take a regional effort to get this plan together. Really wanna thank everyone. Um, with that, we are asking you to recommend approval of the plan and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jacob. If you have any questions uh, for Jacob or Alvin Bedell, please uh, raise your hand and we'll call on you. I will go ahead, uh, Jessica. Yeah, first of all, I wanna say this is such impressive work. It's mind boggling to consider how much effort I had to go into it and how well it's been rolled out and presented. Um, I just had a question um, and I apologize if this is the wrong time to kind of ask it, but um, for the polls that you were able to kind of take in live time where folks are saying, um, how all that aligns with what they would like to see and what they're seeing. Is there any way um, to get more kind of granular feedback from them on what the, the discrepancies, does that um, make sense as a question? Or are yeah. we kind of just relying on the comments that we received to kind of address those? Or yeah, so consider what we those did, future efforts? Oh, sorry, Jessica, didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no worries. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so mm -hmm. let me clarify there a little bit. Again, first of all, it wasn't meant to be scientific by any means, yeah. but what we wanted to do is during the 30 day public comment period, whenever we presented to a group, uh, mm -hmm. whenever we had those touch points, we wanted to do the polling. We kept the polling as the same across mm -hmm. the 30 days. So obviously, you know, kind of the first day, the first presentation we gave people really hadn't had a chance to dig into the plan. Uh, by the end of the 30 days, hopefully, you know, most people did have a chance to engage with it. Um, so there is a little bit of spectrum of results and that's why we're kind of putting them together as, as one big summary. But to specifically answer your question, when we did that, so at our typical sort of public meeting or presentation that we gave, when we asked these polling questions, along with that were some, um, as part of the Mentimeter, there was some kind of interactive discussion slides where people mm -hmm. could actually list for each of those questions, give us some more uh, specific feedback. So for example, when we asked, as you pointed out, you know, how does this align with your ideal transportation system? You know, what do you like? What do you don't like? Mm -hmm. uh, we actually got people to sort of uh, free response right in uh, what was on their mind. And that was included as part of uh, what's in Appendix C of our engagement uh, summary. But that comment was, those comments were definitely part of uh, what, we, what we did as intake as part of that process. That's great, thank you. That answers your questions, Jessica? Yeah, yeah, it did. Okay, thank you. Are there any other um, comments, please raise your hand. Not seeing any, um, would uh, call for a motion. You'd raise your hand for that, appreciate it. Jessica, I see your hand up, are you wanting to make that? 
Nope, I just completely forgot to lower it. Apologies. Okay, Frank, <laughs> I see your hand up. Please yes, go ahead. I would like to move to recommend uh, to approve or adopt, however, what is the correct language, the Regional Transportation Committee, um, the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and associated Dr. Cog, um, the M10 conformity determination and the Denver Southern Subarea eight hour ozone conformity determination. Thank you, Frank. Uh, been moved. And Steve, I see your hand up. Are you a second? Yes, I am a second. Okay. Been moved and seconded. Uh, is there any further discussion? Please raise your hand. Not seeing any, Frank. You're, yeah, thank you, Frank. Um, not seeing any additional. Um, this time we'll uh, vote on it. All those in favor, uh, please unmute and say aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. Are there any abstentions? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. We'll move on to our next briefing from Todd Cottrell on the 2022-2025 Transportation Improvement Program. Todd? Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. So um, we have two documents as part of um, this item this afternoon. Um, so there's the 2022 to 20, 2025 Transportation Improvement Program, and then also the Air Quality Conformity Determination Documents. Um, the Air Quality Conformity Determinations are the exact same documents as you just uh, had and approved in the last item. So what is a TIP? Uh, the Transportation Improvement Program is a short-term planning program identifying the real uh, transportation projects with fiscally constrained federal and state funding. Uh, in other words, whereas the RTP projects and programs are anticipated with reasonably expected funding over a 20 to 30 year period, uh, the TIP is programmed with known funding or as well known as possible uh, over the next four years. Um, the, the Transportation Improvement Program is federally required, um, addressed through the FAST Act requirements, which is the current um, federal legislation for transportation. Um, per the FAST Act, um, TIPS are required to be created every two years. Uh, however, Dr. Cog does create a TIP every two years, uh, and this is to mainly, mainly align with, the, with CDOT's uh, Statewide Transportation Improvement Program, or STIP. Um, however, Dr. Cog only selects projects every four years. Um, so the, pro the last time the projects were selected is obviously with the 20 and the 23 TIP. Um, there was no new projects that were created with this TIP. Um, they were simply just carried over. Um, and you know, if they had uh, funding within 22 to 23. Um, not only are Dr. Cog projects included, um, but it also includes projects that were selected by CDOT and RD, RTD. And of course it helps implement um, the 2050 RTP um, that we just talked about and of course Metro Vision. Uh, so I just want to run through some items that are specifically within the documents. Um, the first being fiscal constraints. Uh, so the TIP is required to include a financial plan um, that shows the anticipated revenues over this four-year period are equal to or exceed the project level expenses that are included within the TIP. Uh, this information is included within chapter one and table one of the draft TIP. Uh, environmental, environmental justice considerations. Uh, as contained within Appendix E, uh, the TIP reviews projects against locations with a higher than regional average of minority and low income communities. Uh, this analysis shows that there's no adverse effects in the distribution of these funded projects compared to those locations. Uh, performance measures is another fast deck requirement, uh, re which reports in the progress towards achieving set goals on tr key transportation measures. Uh, these include safety, uh, pavement and bridge condition, uh, performance, congestion, emissions, um, and transit. Uh, those targets and the number of TIP projects and funding dedicated to achieving each of these targets can be found in Table 2. Um, conformity defined, finding. 
so Elvin covered this within your last presentation, so I won't rehash what he's already mentioned, uh, except to say that the regional, regionally significant projects included within a TIP, so those capacity projects, were included within the network of projects used to de determine the conform conformity and that all the budgets were passed. Uh, project descriptions is also another element that's required to be within the TIP document. Um, this is a key piece of information um, that is outlined within Exhibit 1 of your document. Um, each project can be shown individually or included within a pool of projects and includes important information such as the project scope, um, project cost by year, and the project location. Uh, finally, public involvement is a key piece. Um, the TIP is required to hold a minimum 30-day public comment period. Um, the TIP and the conformity determinations were released for comment on February 10th, um, with the comment period ending on March 17th with the public hearing. Uh, the comments received are included within Attachment 3. Uh, in addition, uh, Dr. Cog has also included a list of changes from the public hearing version of the TIP document to the action draft that is before you today. Uh, and these changes are outlined in attachment four. So that concludes uh, the presentation I have for you today. Um, of course, happy to take any comments or questions that you may have. Um, otherwise, the motion before you is to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee uh, approval of the 22 to 25 Transportation and Permit Program and Associated Air Quality Conformity document. Are there any questions for Todd regarding this? If so, please raise your hand, Phil. Yeah, just a quick comment and just looking out for my folks in Eastern Boulder County. Um, on project 2020-042 on page eight of 14 of the attachment two, just to let you know, um, State Highway 7 and 109, North 119th Street is the actual intersection for that one. So I just wanted to be clarify that before it moves too far forward. We just don't have the, the same avenue numbering up here as, as the rest of the Denver metro area. And with that, I would uh, move, move to, uh, to approve the motion as, as stated by Todd. With, with, the, with the amendment you made? Yeah, with the amendment to the project description. OK, been moved. And Brian, I see you have your hand up. I second it. Okay, it's been moved and second. Are there, is there any discussion? Um, Alex? Uh, yes, this is Alex Hatter with Boulder County. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, with the current um, process for the federal community projects, aka earmarks, we've heard that it's uh, a possibility that some communities might be applying for uh, federal community funding for projects that are currently in the TIP. Um, and if they were to secure federal community project funding, um, how would that be handled with the, with the TIP? Would that just be an administrative modification um, to swap out the funding? And apologies if I'm jumping again, and this is a better question for the next agenda item. Well, Alex, you're, you're correct. Um, uh, depending on the exact amounts of the amendment, uh, it would become either uh, administrative modification or a policy amendment to the document. Okay, thank you. Good question, Alex. Thank you. Are there any additional comments or discussion items on this on the motion? Seeing none, um, we'll go ahead and and uh, move to vote. Um, those in favor, uh, please unmute and signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, uh, unmute and signify by saying no. Any abstentions? Motion passes. We'll now move on to our next uh, item, which uh, again, led by Todd Cottrell on the Transportation Improvement Program TIP waiting list funding distribution. And I know Ron and Todd and his whole crew have spent hours <laughs> going on this. So take it away, guys. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I certainly would like to 
to echo that in, in all the effort that it took to get through the process, especially with the technical staff leads of each of the forums. And, you know, and I think except for the era process, which we went through approximately 12 years ago, uh, this was probably the largest undertaking and certainly the one of the most confusing sort of waiting list processes that we really took. So um, bear with us as we kind of go through this presentation. Uh, hopefully it's sort of set up logically so none of this does get confusing to everyone. Um, so just talk a little bit about the actual waiting list process. Um, so if you recall, Dr. Kaj's staff began this process around a year ago, um, but then certainly halted it to deal with with some of the impacts that we're seeing with COVID that had on the existing TIP projects. So again, that was right around that uh, early April timeframe last year. But the basic overall steps for the actual waiting list process involves um, you know, splitting the available funding, or the known funding that is coming into the region. Of course, this is split 20% to the regional, 80% um, to the sub-regional process, and of course, further broken down for the sub-regional process. Um, second is to advance any existing project funding if the sponsors make that request to us. Uh, and then certainly, you know, finishing up with selecting projects from the individual waiting list. So for this, for this waiting list process, we had a total of $55.759 million available to program. Um, approximately $19.5 million of that was a mix of sort of what I would call our normal funding types. Um, Surface Transportation Block Grant, or STBG, um, Congestion Mitigation Air Quality, or CMAC, uh, Transportation Alternatives, or TA funding, and then Multimodal Options Fund, or MMOF, uh, which is a state funding source. And this is just due to a mix of uh, routine sort of regular project closeouts and return, in addition to additional allocations that Dr. Cog received. Um, the largest chunk of this available funding was $36.2 million of COVID funding. Um, the COVID funding came as part of the bill as the president signed in late 2020, um, of which portions of that were allocated to the MPOs. Um, this COVID STBG funding acts sort of like regular STBG funding with two exceptions. Uh, it must be spent by the end of federal fiscal year 24 and can be used at up to 100% federal, uh, therefore no match is required. Um, through CDOT recommendation and additional discussions that we had internally, uh, it was decided that this funding would go towards construction projects that can advertise within federal fiscal years 21 and or 22. Um, the funding breakdown by the subregion are included in your packet as attachment one. Um, so next we move into sort of the waiting list process that we had. Um, so Dr. Cog began this process by talking to the first sponsors, the first sponsor off of each waiting list, um, asking them if they wish to accept the available funding. Um, I, uh, attachment two in your packet includes each of the waiting lists and the TIP protocol, TIP policy protocols, which outlines this pro process. As sponsors um, responded to Dr. Cog's staff, uh, we kept moving down the list. Uh, if a sponsor um, declined the funding, that project did remain on the list. Um, if they accepted, they were bound to complete the scope with the local match rates that they originally submitted within their application. Uh, then the project was removed from the list. So overall, the decision to accept funding from a, from a waiting list is really the, the sponsor's decision, and it doesn't involve the sub-regional forum process through their discussion and eventual recommendation. Uh, however, we needed that forum involvement to really discuss and have recommendations um, due to two key items. Um, the first, since the COVID funding match rates could be used at up to 100% federal, each forum needed to discuss and recommend if any projects should be awarded this funding without providing those local match rates on the eligible projects. Um, another option was to swap the COVID funding for some of the existing Dr. Cog allocating funding, you know, sort of creating situations where projects could use multiple sources of funding, some which utilize 100% COVID funding um, to fund projects where the overall match rate was lower than the required 20%. In addition, uh, a majority of the forum waiting list had either only a few projects on their list 
or their targeted amount to program was greater than the project totals of their list. So for, for these situations, um, Dr. Cog's staff or, offered potential solutions, um, including recommending you know, brand new projects and or adding additional Dr. Cog funding to existing projects. Um, it should be also noted that many of the options that are recommended by the forums are sort of either against the adopted TIP policy or involves a situation where the policy is silent. So in those cases, um, a little later in the presentation, I'll be pointing out um, those situations, um, which will be part of your action this afternoon. So next, I just wanted to run through the individual forum recommendations and the variances if they are, are, are needed for these projects in this process to advance. Um, the recommendations here are, are included in attachment three. Um, so certainly you could you follow along if necessary from that. So for the regional share, uh, there was a, a total target of approximately $10.5 million. Um, Denver had the first project on their list, which was the Broadway I-25 project, um, and an amount that exceeded the target amount. Uh, so Denver accepted funding for the amount that was available. Um, the second project was from Boulder County, which was funded through their sub-regional process. And the third, which was Broomfield, uh, was removed as it now has been funded locally. For the Adams County sub-region, um, with a target of $6.6 .6 million, uh, North Glen had the first project on the waiting list and accepted $2 million of um, their forum's target amount. Uh, the next two projects belong to Aurora, um, in which they declined their funding, and those two projects will remain on the list. Um, this left a remaining unallocated, unallocated balance of $4.6 million. Um, through forum discussion and recommendation, um, it was to apply the COVID FTBG funding to a portion of the Bennett project and applied the remaining unallocated funds proportionally to all the projects to reduce their overall mat local match rates. Um, this is where we sort of run into the need to ask for a, a variance in the TIP policy, um, which is to add TIP funding to these existing projects. For the Arapaho subregion, um, the only project sponsor to accept funding um, from their waiting list was Littleton, Littleton for the Broadway study. Um, the remaining unallocated target had, was at $7.3 million. And their recommendation was to lower the existing project match rates on some of their projects, as you see on the screen. Um, very similar, um, there would also need to be a variance to add additional funding um, to existing projects. Um, next gets us to the Broomfield subregion. Um, their target was 975,000. Uh, they were able to fund one of their two waiting list projects. It kind of muted me all of a sudden. Uh, for Denver, their target was a little over $10 million. Uh, they were able to fund two projects, one fully and one partially. For the Douglas County subregion, with a target of $4.2 million. Um, Castle Rock had the first project on their list, and they were able to allocate $3.5 million of their request. Um, each of the three remaining waiting list projects did decline the funding, uh, leaving those projects on the list. Uh, but this left an unallocated balance of $699,000. Um, those remaining funds were added to three existing projects to reduce their non federal share. Um, actually, in these three projects that they added funding to, originally took a funding cut um, during the sub-regional call in the previous TIP cycle. Um, a variance would be needed to add the TIP funding to these three existing projects. For Jefferson County, um, or for the Je Jefferson County sub-region with a funding target of $7.7 .7 million. Um, Jefferson County um, had the only project on the wait list and they did decline their funding. Uh, the forum eventual recommendation was to fund two brand new projects and add TIP funding to a, an existing project, which is the Wheat Ridge Wadsworth Boulevard project. Um, in addition, um, the forum did proactively take action to recommend adding an additional $1.6 million of Dr. Cog funds and $400,000 on local match um, 
to the Wheat Ridge Wadsworth Boulevard project if Wheat Ridge decided to cancel their other project, which is on Ward Road. And again, this is a proactive uh, stance that the forum took um, in case that uh, Wheat Ridge did need additional money for their Wadsworth project. Um, this funding transfer to the Wadsworth project would only happen if Wheat Ridge does return the word, their Ward Road funds, um, which would come to a request to Dr. Cog's staff, and then also would be shown within a future tip um, administrative modification. Um, there is a, there's three variances that would be needed for these actions. Um, first of all, there would be an, a variance to select two brand new projects for funding. Um, the second variance to add TIP funding to the existing Wadsworth project from Reed Ridge. And third would be to allow additional funding to the Wadsworth project, um, which is a total of $2 million if Wheat Ridge does return their funds from the Ward Road project and then transfers them to the, um, the Wadsworth project. So just a little bit more explanation about this action that they took proactively. Typically when funds are returned um, back to Dr. Cog, it does go back to the sub-regional forum for them to, to program. This recommendation from the forum just takes action ahead of that discussion so that if the Ward Road funds are returned, um, the funds do go directly to the Wadsworth project. Uh, and finally, for the Southwest Well subregion with a target of well, $1.2 million, uh, both of their projects off the waiting list were funded, in addition to allocating the COVID funding at 80% to two existing projects. And of course, just to balance everything out, balance everything out and to swap some funding sources, um, there are some other actions that are needed uh, included here on the screen. So next steps. Um, one thing that we have now are sort of some forums have depleted waiting lists and Dr. Cog's staff is requesting approval to issue a new call for projects um, to sort of add projects to some of these waiting lists. Um, if you take a look at action or attachment four within your packet, uh, this does, does contain the adjusted waiting lists as they will look after action is taken on this item. So this will help us prepare for a situation if additional funds do come to the region uh, before we get to federal year, um, federal fiscal year 23, uh, which according to TIP policy, if any new funding does come um, to the region after that time, those funds would roll into the next call for projects, which will happen uh, for the 24 to 27 TIP. Um, I think this is especially important as as you know, if you've been following any of the infrastructure bill and fast act renewals on the federal level, in addition to um, tra the transportation discussions that have been happening on the state level. It's important to point out that this call is not associated with any new funding that is coming to Dr. Cog. It is solely just to increase the projects, um, increase and add projects to the adjusted waiting list. Um, staff is proposing that any project selected from this call be placed on the individual waiting lists after the existing projects that are already on the list in score order. Um, in addition, uh, we anticipate holding both the regional and sub-regional calls at the same time um, within with the existing applications that we have that were used for the 20 to 23 call. Um, and with staff scoring these applications and then convening a a panel to sort of validate the scores that Dr. Cog's staff comes up with. Throughout this entire process, we are also thinking of uh, additional ways to sort of restrict sponsors of taking advantage of submitting lower scoring projects, simply just to place them on their waiting list for potential funding. Um, so potential solutions include only allowing you know, applications from sponsors and subregions that have sort of less than one year's worth of Dr. Cog funding. So for example, um, on average, Dr. Cog does receive approximately $75 million per year. Um, sort of using that $75 million per year benchmark, if we split that to the regional and sub-regional shares, um, just using regional share as an example, um, that would come to $15 million. Um, the regional share waiting list after this action takes place 
um, their waiting list will not be depleted and has you know a zero amount of projects. Um, we would certainly limit the number of submittals based on the exact funding target. So those subregions that have a higher target amount, um, i.e. the ones that have little to no current waiting list projects, would have a higher number of allowable submittals, um, which would certainly restrict the number of projects that could be and get onto each list. I think it's also certainly foreseeable that not every project submitted would get added to a waiting list. Um, if this carries through all nine of the waiting lists, which include the eight subregion, eight subregions plus the regional, um, only sponsors from just over half of the subregions would be eligible to submit. Um, we certainly are working through this process um, and certainly will let sponsors know um, as we get later on um, into this month where we can release this call for projects. Um, that is anticipated after the action, hopeful action takes place at the A April board meeting. Um, and if that takes place, we should be able to bring this back to the board for action in September. So now we get to the recommended action. Um, I know this is a bit lengthy, but we wanted to make sure that we included every aspect of this item. Um, so the recommendation is to um, it recommend the following actions to the Regional Transportation Committee to allocate the available funding to projects in the 22 to 25 tip. Um, first, the projects and funding changes that are outlined in attachment three. Um, any of the tip variances to the specific subregional forums is outlined within the memo. Um, adjustment to the waiting lists, which are outlined in attachment four. Um, to also issue a new call for projects, to select projects for individual waiting lists, and of course, to administratively modify the 22 to 25 tip. This will all happen after um, the 22 to 25 tip is adopted. So I will go ahead and stop there. Um, certainly take any comments or questions that you may have. If you have questions, uh, please uh, raise your hand. Alex, I see you've raised your hand. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it's Alex Hatter with Boulder County. Um, quick question, Todd. I'm not sure if I caught this right. You're saying that there will be a call for projects for all of the different subregions, regardless of how many projects are on their current wait list, but the number of projects on the wait list might influence how many projects are accepted in sure. this subsequent call. Go ahead, Todd. Todd. Ron, can you answer if Todd doesn't hear? <laughs> Todd, you're muted. So, Ron, go ahead. Todd, Todd, did we lose you? Yeah, so Alex, thanks, thanks for the question. I think um, Todd and I are still working through uh, some of the details around how to structure this supplemental call to kind of replenish wait lists. Um, we're, we're trying to figure out sort of what should be the target amount available um, for, for the wait list. We don't want to, we don't want to go, we don't want to overdo it and sort of have everyone prepare um, too many applications and, and go and rank too many uh, applications, um, kind of trying to estimate how much new money might become available if it does. And again, it's very uncertain still if any if any new funding will become available sort of this year. If it becomes available next year, we'll wrap that into the next major tip call. So we're really kind of dealing with funding for this year. Um, but I think once we've settled on a target amount, we'll probably look at the at the remaining current wait list for each subregion and sort of uh, work with the subregions to establish um, what the right what the right framework is for each subregion, and if some and if and if a subregion has wait lists in an amount um, equal to or above the target amounts, then we will not do a supplemental call for those subregions. Okay, and then I, I guess a follow up question is: Does Dr. Cog have an idea of how much is going to come from the this latest stimulus, like the American Recovery Act from the Biden administration? Well, again, the the well, the proposed infrastructure package that just that just was the framework for which was just released. Is that what you're talking about? Um, no, the the one right before that. So that that the most recent COVID relief bill did not include general transportation 
uh, resources in it. Okay. It only it only it included money for state and local governments. It included some very specific money for certain categories of spending, like K through 12 education. It did include transit money to transit agency to urban transit agencies, but it didn't have general transportation funding like the CRISA Act did in December. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, Brian, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, so, so are we looking at the um, uh, forums doing the selection like we did the last time and using similar criteria? Is that the intent with the new call? Yeah, Todd, I don't know if you can, I'm not trying to usurp you here, Todd, but I'm not sure if you can hear or unmute. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'll, I'll finish and then I'll let Todd take over after this question. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, we have a TIP policy. We have TIP, we have TIP project criteria and um, selection criteria that were used for last TIP, and that's exactly what we're proposing. We're not proposing any changes to the criteria. Um, we do want to kind of streamline the process, um, but the, the um, subregions will make the recommendations to the board just uh, like other um, calls for, like the main call for project during the development of the the previous step. And how much time are you anticipating the uh, forums having? Go ahead, Todd. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I had some audio issues and I didn't really hear half the question. All right, <laughs> I, no, no, I apologize. No, no worries, Todd. Um, so Brian, I, th I think what we're, what we're envisioning is perhaps ha allowing um, local project sponsors maybe eight weeks to prepare and submit um, project proposals using using the same application form that was utilized um, during the development of the 2020 through 23 tip. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Alex, did you have an additional question or some discussion on this? Oh, okay, Sorry, hand no. away. Okay, thank you, Alex. Um, are there any others that have questions for uh, Todd? Or Ron. Seeing none, I uh, entertain a motion. Please raise your hand if you'd like to make that. Brian? I'll make a motion of this lengthy uh, motion if I could. Uh, recommend the following action to the Regional Transportation Committee to allocate available funding to projects in the 2022 to 2025 tip. Uh, one, project funding changes as outlined in the attachment number three. Two, tip policy variances for specific uh, region, sub-regional forums as outlined in the individual forum recommendation subsection to allow programming actions. Three, Adjustments to waiting list as outlined in attachment four. Uh, number four, issue a new call for projects to, selected pro to select projects for individual waiting list. And five, administer administratively modify the 2022 to 2025 tip. Thank you, Brian. And Frank Bruno, I see you have your hand up. I do, and I just wanted Brian to do that heavy lifting of reading that, but I second it. Okay, thank you, Frank. So it's been moved and seconded. Is there any additional uh, discussion on the motion? If so, please raise your hand. Seeing none, um, we'll go ahead and vote. Please unmute and signify by saying aye if you're in favor of the motion. Aye. 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 So, all those opposed, please unmute and signify by saying no. Are there any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Todd and Ron, for that. At this time, we'll move into informational briefings. Um, it was, and Josh will be presenting the fiscal year 2022, fiscal 20, year 2023 unified work program um, and its attachment F in your uh, document. Josh, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
One of the documents that Dr. Cog creates in its role as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Denver region uh, is the Unified Planning Work Program or UPWP. This is a federally required document that lists all of the activities that utilize federal transportation planning funds taking place in the region over a two year period. This document is used internally to help to budget and allocate agency resources as well as staff time to the activities that we know we want to engage in as well as externally to communicate with our partners um, what, what we are actually doing uh, with federal dollars in the region. At this time, staff is beginning the development of a new UPWP document covering federal fiscal years 2022 to 2023. Uh, the majority of the activities listed in this document will likely carry forward uh, in some form from the current document as staff continues to complete their regular day to day activities. Um, although in attachment one of your memo, uh, we have listed some major changes that we anticipate taking place uh, between the two documents. Just very briefly, I'll run through these. Um, this first section deals with tasks that are expected to be complete or are already complete, um, but completed within the horizon date of September 30th of the current year. That's the horizon of the current document. These include the RTP and TIP, as well as the UPWP, all of which are being uh, presented to you today, as well as some of our other documents that have been produced, including our regional vision zero plan, our regional freight plan, uh, regional complete streets toolkit, um, our federal certification process, which takes place every four years, as well as our annual reports on traffic congestion in the region. Some of the new proposed tasks that we expect include the development of our upcoming new TIP covering 2024 to 2027, um, the new UPWP for 2024 to 2025, uh, again, the annual reports on traffic congestion in the region, updates to our federal performance measures that were introduced through the FAST Act, a recalibration of our travel demand model called FOCUS, as well as a new uh, Dr. Cog-led uh, local agency assistance program for corridor and small area planning. Um, so some next steps for the UPWP, uh, staff is currently develop, uh, reviewing um, the lists of tasks and deliverables in the document. Um, those will be updated to the new time period of 2022 to 2023. Following that, uh, we anticipate bringing a completed draft document back to TAC at your June meeting, and then bringing that to the board of directors for their action at their July meeting. So today we just like to uh, open it up to tech members to see if you have any questions about the document or any comments or suggestions that we can take as we begin the development of this document. So I'd be happy to take any of those at this time. Are there any questions or comments for Josh um, and his staff as they start to uh, work on this document? If so, please raise your hand. Josh, I'm not seeing any hands raised at this time. So thank you for your presentation. And uh, if you do have comments, please email them to Josh at Dr. Cobb. Thank you. Our next item is a presentation on the Colorado Department of Transportation Senate Bill 267, year three funding. And Ron, I understand you're gonna start off this, or lead this discussion. So thank you. I will, thank you, Kent. Um, Ron Papsdorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations at Dr. Cog. Just wanted to get this in front of the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, so a little bit of history, and then I'll, I'll um, share some of the materials that were in the packet. Hopefully I had a chance to review some of that. Um, just by way of reminder, back in 2017, the legislature adopted Senate Bill 267 that authorized four years worth of lease purchase agreements um, on state facilities to raise a total of uh, at that at that time, two billion dollars, um, basically in four five hundred million dollar installments each year, uh, beginning in fiscal year eighteen nineteen. Um, as part of that legislation, CDOT receives 
1.8 billion dollars of the of the two billion dollars uh, from the proceeds of those lease purchase agreements. Uh, back in 2019, the Colorado Transportation Commission approved um, 1.6 billion dollar list of projects uh, for funding in fiscal year 20 and 22 using the first two years of Senate Bill 267 uh, resources. Uh, I think the state anticipates that the state treasurer's office will issue um, sometime very soon within the next month or so the third year of Senate Bill 267 um, lease purchase agreements um, and make that money available. So the uh, CDOT is considering the third year of um, investments uh, using, using those resources. Um, CDOT staff presented a draft list of um, proposed projects to fund with the third year proceeds uh, it, at the statewide transportation advisory committee stack on March 12th. Um, I believe it is scheduled for further consideration at stack this Friday and um, CDOT's intending to take the take a decision package to the transportation commission at their meeting in April. So we wanted to get this in front of the TAC, just give you an opportunity to review that. Um, and provide any comments so that we can uh, represent you um, in any, any feedback to the state as they consider this. So I will um, first, before I, before I ask if CDOT has, has, uh, wants to make any comments, I will quickly share a couple of key slides from the presentation was sh that was shared. Uh, okay. Getting used to this new format, like everyone else. Let's see. Uh, Kent, can you see my? Can you see that first slide that's titled Senate Bill Two Sixty Seven Year Three? Yes, Project. we can see that. All right, thank you. So I uh, covered the um, overview. Um, keep in mind that uh, the state uh, has has set some sort of target distributions of these resources over the four year period to each region, each CDOT region around the state. So region one's uh, trending a little below the target, but we're getting but we're getting close. And um, CDOT is um, intent on reaching those uh, four-year targets uh, through through the fourth year of investments. Uh, they talk about the highway and the transit pieces. So here is the uh, Senate Senate Bill 267 Year Three project options for region one. Um, all of which is in the Dr. Cog region. So uh, the I-70 corridor, uh, I-70 West Floyd Hill, $135 million. I-70 corridor West Metro Bridges, uh, Award Road uh, Bridge Rehab Project, $33.4 million. Um, Idaho Springs Mobility Hub, $4.1 million using the transit portion of the funds that are available. I should mention that Senate Bill 267 requires at least 10% of the resources to be spent on transit multimodal improvements. Um, on the I-25 corridor, uh, the Lone Tree Mobility Hub, $8 million, again, using the transit uh, capital piece of the funds. The I-25 and State Highway 7 Interchange Mobility Hub uh, for pre-construction activities at $1.5 million. And again, pre-construction activities at the Castle Rock Mobility Hub for $300,000. On the I-270 corridor, um, $30 million uh, for um, I-270 improvements from I-76 to I-70. And then um, non-corridor specific uh, proposals, some fleet purchases for the busting system at three point, almost $3.2 million, uh, a maintenance facility for busting uh, in, the Den in region one at $500,000 for pre-construction activities and recognizing that region one um, does not have a lot of projects on the shelf ready for anticipation of year four resources or other resources that might become available. Um, they're proposing $19 million to go to some pre-construction activities for projects on the year five through 10 of the 10 year, um, CDOT 10 year pipeline of projects list to get a um, set of projects sort of more ready uh, for either year four of Senate Bill 267 funding or other funding sources as they become available. Um, let's see, that's the entirety of the Region 1 list. Does, does someone from CDOT Region 1 want to speak to anything I probably messed up or missed? 
Hey, uh, Ron, uh, can you hear me? This is Paul Jositis. That's Paul. Yeah, um, so I think you covered it pretty good. As everybody can see, you know, we're focused on establishing a list of shelf projects. Um, should we get year five through 10? Um, so that's what that list of projects is. No huge surprise there. You know, we've got uh, some region one bottleneck projects that we want to design. We've got some wildlife crossings. The Kinney Run Wildlife Crossing is there on US 6 in Golden, where we've got a herd of elk that cross the road um, that uh, really creates a safety problem. We've got um, another segment of the US 85 corridor. Of course, that um, EIS was signed in 2003. So there's a couple segments that are left to finish that one. We've got um, I-70 truck escape ramps, which uh, we had that horrible crash a couple of years back where uh, four people perished when a out of control truck uh, ran into a bunch of cars that were stopped for a, cra a different crash at Denver West. Um, highway I-25 and State Highway 7, um, just uh, mobility hub, interim transit type stuff. So a lot of mobility hub stuff in our, in our list. Um, of course, Interstate 270 and I-70 at Floyd Hill are some of our big projects that we're really uh, focused on in the next few years. And then, uh, you know, lastly, a couple projects on the I-70 West Quarter, the I-70 climbing lane as you approach the Eisenhower Tunnel in the westbound direction, really steep grade there. Um, we want to um, add a climbing lane in that location, which was part of the 2011 record of decision. And then um, I think everybody's heard by now, if you haven't read the Denver Post, we've got a lot of deferred maintenance at the Eisenhower Tunnel um, that we also need to put some work into the design. So if we get stimulus or other funding, we'll be ready to go. And um, I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has them. Thanks, Paul. Let me let me go down to region four real quick since uh, region four is here as well. Oops, went way too far. Okay, five, four, I'll, um, let's see. There's region three. Okay, this is the first slide of region four. And again, um, since part of region four is in the Dr. Cog region, let's see if I can catch these. Uh, you've got the Firestone Longmont Mobility Hub phase two for right of way acquisition for a million dollars uh, and $2 million uh, for um, uh, some access improvements as a first phase uh, uh, of improvements at, at that access point. Um, let's see, we've got pre-construction activities, including the um, State Highway 119 uh, corridor um, in the Dr. Cog region uh, for $1.5 million. That also includes some pre-construction for State Highway 71 corridor and State Highway 385, both of which are outside of Dr. Cog, I believe. Um, and then on the second, Sheet. I think that's it for the Dr. Cog portion of the Region 4 list. Um, I saw um, a couple of folks from Region 4. If I mess that up, please feel free to correct. Yeah, hi, Ron. This is Heather Paddock. I'm on. Hi, Heather. Um, and and um, I was just going to note that um, you know Region 4 had a lot of projects that I would say were front-loaded. In the Senate bill years, um, I-25 being the big ones, but we also had a project out on I-70 that was also under construction under in, in year one. And so region four wasn't really anticipating year three funds. Um, fortunately, there were there were a few extra dollars that we could um, get some rural paving projects done as well as some of the much needed um, funds for the mobility hubs and pre-construction as well as some follow-up pre-construction on uh, 119. So I'm happy to take any questions, but Region 4 does have a pretty light list here in year three. Thanks, Heather. So with that, I did want to, I do want to just go down to the um, 10 year pipeline of projects that um, CDOT did adopt and maybe queue up for a little bit of discussion and try to prompt some feedback from TAC, particularly on the um, pre-construction activities, that $19 million proposed by Region 1, because um, as you can as you can imagine, um, you know, investing now in pre-construction activities really does queue up and set priorities for then when actual when money becomes available to actually move forward on a project. So um, 
a decision to invest in pre-construction activities now does, does establish some priorities um, and means that maybe other things that you don't spend pre-construction activities on um, then aren't as high a priority. So um, this is the list from the 10-year pipeline of projects for years five through 10 um, of the uh, statewide plan. And um, wanted to note those and if folks have had a chance to uh, think about that $19 million. If you have any feedback, if CDOS list is, is great with everybody, great, then we can provide that feedback as a region back to CDOT as they further consider this list, but just wanted to cue that up and see if there's any feedback on any of this from members of TAC. Thank you, Ron. Are there any, is there any feedback for Ron, Heather, or Paul on, on these lists? If so, please raise your hand. Sarah Grant from Broomfield. I can Go ahead. Me? Yes. Thank you. It's Sarah Grant from City County of Broomfield. I have a question and a comment. So the first question is, is the funding identified in SB 267 intended to supplement the intended funding for um, the projects that have been identified in the plan in years one to four and in five to 10, should we be able to secure that funding for years five to 10? I'll, I'll take a stab, Sarah, and then ask CDOT, but um, it, when the 10-year pipeline of projects was originally put together, the intent of the years one through four was uh, to be funded with Senate Bill 267 funding. Obviously, um, COVID kind of put a wrinkle in sort of some resources for CDOT, so I know the commission did um, in 2020 consider some adjustments and some add-back packages. Um, CDOT staff can probably add a little bit more detail to that. Yeah, Ron, uh, Paul, just say this here. You know, I would just say, um, you know, our tenure list is really for the region. The list of projects, as you said, we're focusing on for, for that next tenure period. So yes, years one through four were the, uh, you know, quote, funded years. And of course, we're getting year three is what's coming in now. There's no guarantee we'll get year four a year from now. Um, but as we went through that pro, uh, planning process, uh, what was that, a year ago or so, um, that's where we went to all the eight counties and got all the input from everybody as to what they saw as their priorities. Um, using all that data and other data that we had through the planning process, we put together this 10-year list. Um, now that um, you know we're getting closer to year five, we actually went back through this list as a region, scrubbed it, kind of decided what made the most sense to, you know, uh, deliver, should we get more money in the future? And that's how we came up with that list of pre-construction projects. Great, thank you for that clarification. And um, my, my comment will be as far as the, the list goes is advocating for I-25 and Colorado 7 as, um, CDOT is investing in mobility hubs up and along I-25 corridor and um, Colorado 7. We're planning for a mobility hub there that connects into the region along Colorado 7 and um, is critical for mobility for the future. So um, I think this is a great list that a lot of work has gone into, um, but I just wanted to put in the comment for uh, the I-25 Colorado 7 for pre-construction activity. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I see uh, Long, you have your uh, hand raised. Go ahead, Long. Um, yeah, this question for Paul. Hey, Paul, so from that, this list here, it lists the year from one to four, and I don't see the I-270 on the list. How is that? Yeah, yeah so if, um, I think he's got it on the wrong slide. You'd have to go up. Yeah, he, uh, Ron's got it there. So yeah, this is um, this is the years five through ten list. So the years one through four is what he's brought up there. So yeah, two seventies on the list. Okay, thanks. Did that answer your right. question, Long. Yes, sir. Okay, thank I was, you. I was I was focusing on the five through ten year list because that's where CDOT is um, selecting projects for pre-construction activities for that nineteen million dollars portion. Any other questions on the region one, five through 10 list? Brian, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so 
Some of the uh, projects are, I'll consider program type projects. So bottleneck reduction and um, let's even say vision zero uh, priority list. How did you prioritize in within those programs that aren't specific projects as listed in the prior or listed in the five through 10 list? Yeah, thanks for the question, um, Brian. We're actually really um, proud of our bottleneck uh, reduction program. So we actually have a strategic bottleneck reduction plan. I'm happy to share it with anybody who wants to see it, but we've actually gone across the metro area, prioritized where our most persistent bottlenecks are that we could actually take a low cost action to. And by low cost, I mean less than $3 million. So example of one that's, uh, you know, a few that have been recently com completed, um, westbound US 6 at Knox Court, we did a really low cost striping and barrier project and um, really got a great improvement on uh, operations at that location. We added a, a lane on um, eastbound I-70 near Ward Road, Kipling um, area. That took um, a, a persistent bottleneck that was there every morning in the eastbound direction and pretty much eliminated it. So we have this nice list of, geez, I don't know what it is, 30 or so um, planned bottleneck reduction projects. And it's really the ones that we think we could spend just a little bit of money on to get a great improvement to our highway system. So that's, you know, that's kind of how we did that one. Um, that plan continues to evolve. Like I say, I'm happy to share it with people if you're interested in it. We're, we're pretty proud about all the great things we've been doing with that program. And um, as far as um, vision zero priority improvements, you know, these are uh, things I think I think really um, Safer Main Streets is a good example of, of a program that sort of uh, supplemented that program. Um, so, so that's just a small amount of money where if uh, we see a location that we have a safety problem, we can do something with that problem. So I, on that one, on Vision Zero, we don't really have a um, priority list um, identified yet. I don't know if that answers your question, but at least on the... Uh, on the bottleneck reduction, that's an example. Signal upgrades, we have different lists that uh, we could we could get into more detail with if you'd like. Thank you. That was, that was a general question. And then more specifically to Rappo County, I'm questioning State Highway 30. And are you looking at that as devolution money as we've talked in the past, or are you looking at actually doing some type of improvement? Yeah, Brian, I mean, that's that, that those were the discussions that we've had in the past that uh, we could do some improvements in the future and take it off, off our system at that point. It's State Highway is really a roadway that, uh, you know, ends at Quincy, as you know, and um, very, very uh, difficult for us to maintain when we're trying to maintain Interstate 70 as that roadway gets wider and wider. Um, so that is the idea there. Brian, did you have any additional questions? Nope. Any other uh, questions on the region one? Ron, will you bring up the region four projects? Um, best, best that can't, although I will say that region four, as, as Heather said, um, has less resources available in uh, year three because of that kind of regional equity discussion that's going on around the state um, and the front loading of the first two years of Senate Bill 267 spending um, on a couple of large projects in, in region four. So I, I don't believe that region four, other than um, other than um, some money towards the State Highway 119 corridor is proposing any other uh, kind of project, project pre-development work. Is that correct, Heather? Out of year three?
I'm not seeing. Did we lose Heather? I think we lost Heather. Anyone else? I thought I saw. Jim is here from Region 4. Jim, do you know the answer to that question? Did you repeat that again, Ron? <laughs> yeah, sure, Jim. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was just, I was just um, reiterating what Heather had, had said to the group that, you know, since, since sort of investments in Region 4 were sort of front-loaded with the first couple of years of Senate Bill 267 resources for some larger projects, that Region 4 wasn't really proposing any sort of um, significant sort of pre-construction activities on projects within Dr. Cog at this point, other than uh, some some funding for State Highway 119 corridor. Yep, that's correct. Does yeah. anyone have discussion on, on, on Region 4? Please raise your hand. I'll bring back that. I do not see any hands raised, so I think we're good there, Ron. Yep. Do you have any additional items or need a further comment from the PAC? I don't, thank you. Okay. Will this go to the to the um, board or will this just stay at the TAC? Oh, uh, we're we're going to present this to the board in study session at their work session on uh, Wednesday evening. This week. Okay, thank you. If, if Ron, you don't have any additional, we'll go ahead and move on to the next, which is uh, administrative items. And um, Carson, if you have an update on the AMP working group, that'd be great. Carson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I do. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good, just making sure with this new platform. Uh, the AMP working group met early last month, uh, a while ago now, to receive informational briefings from CDOT regarding their transit electrification efforts and their work in creating a transit emissions dashboard. Excel Energy also gave an informational presentation about their transportation electrification plan from the grid side of that picture. Uh, and we heard an update regarding the recent work coming out of the data and data sharing focus area group that is within the AMP working group. Uh, that's the only updates I have, Mr. Chair. Any questions for Carson from the group? Quiet group today. Um, with that, are there any other uh, member comments or other matters to come before TAC? Uh, Ron? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Everyone is quiet, and I, I will um, say thanks for everyone adapting to sort of the new meeting, uh, meeting platform using Zoom. Uh, we certainly will continue to encourage you to uh, feel free to turn on your video, uh, members and alternates for these meetings. Uh, one, of, one of Dr. Cog's um, objectives of, um, of moving over to Zoom was to facilitate um, uh, being able to accommodate more folks on video and more interaction at these meetings. I know a year late, but better late than never. Um, and so feel free to do that for future meetings. Um, and um, so I wanted to get that out there. Second of all, I did want to just uh, uh, add my thanks and appreciation um, and acknowledgements to everyone and their hard work on the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, it, is, it is a significant and important um, effort uh, for the region. Um, I want to especially thank Jacob and Alvin um, and the planning team at Dr. Cog throughout the organization for their work um, on the project, but, but also really sincerely express my appreciation to our planning partners, um, CDOT and RTD, as well as our local government members. Um, you all made that possible. And I know you all put a lot of time and effort into, into this and, and developing that plan and getting it to this point. And, and it, it is really a foundational piece of work for the region and will set the stage through the next UPWP for the work that we do together in 22 and 23, as well as the next, the next major tip cycle and the investment decisions we all make together to, to make this plan a reality and really um, help us all collectively achieve the goals that we've set for ourselves as a region. So I just wanted to add my thanks and appreciation uh, to what Jacob said earlier uh, for all of your work on, on, the, on the plan. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ron. Uh, any additional member comments or other comments, please raise your hand. I do not see any. Um, our next meeting will be April 26th. Um, and uh, with that, I call us adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, everyone. Thank you.